Our scripture this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 9 to 11. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. So last week our sermon was uh, talking about the idea that this place, this world that we're living in is a mess. And I'm guessing that with everything that's transpired in this past week, our viewpoint of that has not changed very much. Yes, this world is still a mess. So then, what are we going to do about it? Who is going to be a part of the crew that cleans it up? Who is ready to get to work? You know, the... Often the, uh, when we ask such a question, the response that we get back is silence. Now, one of the most important and least thankful jobs that I think you can do in this church and in the Methodist church is to be on the nominations committee. See, it's always so much fun for you to go up to your brothers and sisters and ask them if they're willing to serve in a new role in the church or if they're willing to take on a bigger role in the church. And if you don't get a no, no thank you, as, your, as the response to what you've asked, you often get a, well, let me think about it. Which means that you, as the nominations committee person, now gets to think of ways to try and cajole that person into taking on that role in serving. Now I understand And don't get me wrong, I have been the person being asked to serve on a committee and in other groups as well. And you might feel like you just don't have the time to devote to being part of a committee. And you might feel like you aren't good enough to sit on a board or help make decisions. And you might feel angry about how things went the last time you were part of a committee. And these are all the thoughts and feelings that each one of us wrestles with whenever we're asked to serve. However, I want you to consider this. If you are asked to serve, you need to know that the people that are on that nominations committee have prayed about who they should be asking to serve. And your name was the name that was brought to them by God. So if you feel like you don't have time to serve on that committee or be a part of it, understand that everyone knows that you might miss a meeting or two. If you feel like you aren't good enough, the people wouldn't have asked you if they thought you weren't good enough. And God wouldn't have put your name forward to them if he thought you weren't good enough. And if you're still angry about the way things went the last time you were on a committee, Ask yourself this question. Am I willing to hold back my talents, my service to God because of my own pride? And if you still are not willing to let go of that anger and serve, I would simply remind you of this. Jesus Christ was willing to suffer on a cross for you. I think you can put your pride aside to serve him. Now often when I'm at home and I ask my children for help cleaning up, The first response that I get from them is silence. It's as if when I was speaking, I didn't actually say the words. Now, I don't know if my voice is not loud enough or if they are so enthralled with what they are doing at the time that they just don't hear me the first time I ask or if they are desperately looking for a hiding place when I ask them to help clean up the first time. But I almost never get a response. The second time when I ask for help, 
with cleaning up, I get the response of this. I didn't make the mess. It's not my mess. Why is it my problem? They are the ones that threw all the toys over there. You should talk to them about it. And the third time when I ask, I know that they hear me. And I'm pretty sure the neighbors next door hear me as well. You see, we see this response when we ask others to help us make things better in this world as well. Often we get silence, and we feel as if people haven't heard our call. See, we as people love to have two-way communication, meaning that we speak and are heard, and that they speak and we hear. Most of us, however, do struggle with that hearing part. And we need to be willing to listen to the others and hear their calls for help as well. After all, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So you should listen twice as much as you speak. So when we read our traditional passages for this week of Advent, uh, one of the ones that we see often used is Mark 1.3, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. We usually take time to talk about John the Baptist, and to, he reminds us that we have not been paying attention. And John shouts at us to wake us up. He dresses oddly to capture our fascination. He storms up and down the riverbank, asking us to take the plunge. And he doesn't seem to be here to listen, right? John is calling out, make straight the path. He's here to talk, he's here to announce, and he's here to shout. It's a one-way communication. He is telling us to get ready because the Lord is coming. But it is a two-way communication because John is asking something from us. He's asking us to join the road crew. We've got to level these streets and straighten out those curves. So what does that mean for us, brothers and sisters? It means we have to clean up our own hearts and bodies. We've got to straighten our own behavior. We need to be thinking about how to make straight the path of justice for all the people in this world. We need to make straight the path to wholeness for the people of this world who have been kept on the winding path for too long. Helping them to see that the straight path is the one that Jesus wants them to be on. No matter how you look at it, there is work to be done. A response needs to be made. John wants us to be participants in our salvation. And the reason that John wants us to do this, to be a participant, to be working in our salvation, is because of this. You see, Jesus doesn't make us worship him because he's all-powerful. He doesn't subjugate us and make us his servants, although he very well could. But he wants us to allow and allows us to choose to be his servants. And he allows us to choose to follow him and gain salvation. Yet some will argue that this is never about a two-way communication. It's only ever about taking marching orders from the one in charge. It's about obedience. God speaks, we do. All of this is about following orders. Get to work. Clean this up. Take care of that. Do this, don't do that and on and on and on. That is hardly a two-way street, is what some would argue. This is the Lord's highway that we're straightening after all, and we all know that it's the Lord's way or the highway, right? But not according to Isaiah. See, we have to get the whole picture. This conversation doesn't begin just with Jesus or with John. It began long before that. Jesus was the response that we are given. But here I was here, Isaiah 4, 1 to 2. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. See, God heard the cry. And now comes the response. God listened to us. And now he speaks. And the word that God spoke to us is in the sending of Jesus. Oh, that wasn't the word the first hearers of Isaiah's words heard. What they heard was home. 
See, the people of God were in exile, cut off from the land they loved. And they cried out to God, and they confessed that they had forgotten to live as God's people, and now they are paying the price. Their society began to cater to those of power and influence and wealth, and many suffered because of it. Sounds awful familiar to us, doesn't it? They forgot to look out for the ones on the margins, and now they were all on the margins. The systems in which they had placed their trust were no longer strong enough to support the life that they took for granted. So they cried out, and God heard. You see, we find ourselves sometimes crying out for God, just like this. And he's going to bring us home, too. Not to the physical home of Israel that the Jews were crying out for, but to the community that God wants us to create. He's going to bring us into relationships that are going to fulfill and connect us. This is the home we seek. And it's the home that we find in Jesus. The child in the manger and the Savior on the cross speak of home to us. Home is where we are loved. Home is where we are healed. And home is where we are heard. And we have to strive to make our church a place where all of these things are true. But we must also work as the cleanup crew for our community at large. We can't afford to be like children saying things like, this is not my mess. I did not create this mess. Let them fix this mess. They're the ones who made it. And we can't be like others who simply respond with silence. Because we are told in our scripture today this, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might and his arms rule for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. That is what our response must be. You see, he is coming. Here is your God. The Lord God comes with might. And we know that that is our sign. We know that our company is coming, and we want to be ready. We want to be the host for the one and the ones who will come. But our message remains clear to us. We have to get to work cleaning up this mess, because company is coming. This week, my challenge for you is to think about where is it that you can start being a part of the cleanup crew for this mess.